Day 98 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Anybody get a chance to take a look at the solar eclipse today? I hope you did so safely if you did. And if you are following any of the spiritual aspects, it's really quite interesting. Nothing to be fearful of, nothing to get anxiety over. However, the thing that I wanted to say here is because I know a lot of people are probably getting anxious about it, especially when it comes to time frames and things like that. Let us not forget that nobody knows the day or the hour of when Jesus is going to return. And really, if somebody told us that he was coming back in 40 days, it should not affect us spiritually because we should be living our lives today as if he is coming back in 30 seconds. So time frames should never affect us in that sense. Now, what it does do though, is when we start hearing things like Jesus is coming soon and we start seeing the signs of the times because he did say that there would be signs and it seems as if we're seeing those things, there should be an urgency for us to get other people ready for the return of Jesus. But I will say, I am usually not really swayed by those kinds of videos that are prophetic today, but this one really caught my attention, and I think it's definitely worth checking out. I don't have any links. All you need to do really is just search Christian solar eclipse and you will see all of these videos pop up. So the gist of it is, is that a solar eclipse happened seven years ago. The path that it traveled on went across seven cities named Salem right here in the United States. And of course, Salem means peace. Well, now here we are seven years later and the path that this solar eclipse is taking is going across seven cities named Nineveh. And if you remember Nineveh from the story of Jonah, he was supposed to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he wanted God to destroy it, but he was supposed to go there to tell them to repent. And in the end, he gave them 40 days to repent. So this is what I'm talking about because I don't want people to start going around saying, Jesus is coming back in 40 days because nobody knows that. And if anybody says that, then they're lying because they don't know. But I think when we do hear words like this, because the Bible does clearly say that He will speak through us, through the sun, the moon, and the stars, we should pay attention, and there should be an urgency, and it should be fueled by excitement and joy, because I am looking forward to seeing Jesus. I am looking forward to the wrongs being righted. I am looking forward to what He is going to do, and I hope you guys are too. So, with that said, welcome to Bible study. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. We are opening up a new book today, First Samuel, and this is interesting, because Samuel is the last of the judges, but he's kind of like this bridge between the judges and the kings or the judges and the new set of prophets that are going to come on the scene. Because right now they're in their spiritual low. There really have been no major prophets since the time of Moses and Aaron, like 400 years prior. So this is kind of a big deal. And we will be reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation. But before we begin, as always, if you're part of the Heart Die fam, I would love it if you could partner with us and just hit that thumbs up button. It's not much effort, but it really does help to get these videos out to the rest of the world to continue getting people excited for God's Word. This is the most important place that we could be on a daily basis. This is where you're going to hear His voice. This is where you're going to grow. This is where you're going to have that confidence that your salvation is sure because you are putting in the effort to draw near to Him. And whenever you do that, He's going to show Himself right there with you. So I would love it if you could help us do that. Also, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, got that notification bell on. And if you want to join us in our small groups, we've got a wonderful Facebook group family or community. Now, if you're new here, welcome to this Bible study. You can check out our website, heartdive.org. Lots of information there. Also in the description box, we've got our statement of belief. We've got extra resources, all the things that I use in my Bible, the highlighters, the pens, all the books that I like to study from. But if you have any questions, you can just put those in the comments below. So we're going to go ahead and jump into this. Let's pray first though, so that we can prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we love you. We just stand in awe of who you are today. Being able to be alive, to be able to see another solar eclipse, God, that we aren't going to see for another 20 years if we're still here. But we're excited, Jesus, for the day that you're going to return. I just pray, Lord, that our hearts are ready and calmed and at peace and actually excited for that day, knowing that we will be with you in heaven. And I pray that you will help us, Lord, to prepare others for that day, God, so that they are also ready to be able to be caught up into the heavens with you. And even even, Lord, if you aren't going to rapture us, because really, there's the argument. I know there's some people saying, we're not getting rapture, Kanoi. Lord, help us to be ready anyway. We want to live every single moment of our lives as if you are going to take our breath away. And so I just pray that this will be a start here as we open up your word today. Will you do a work within us, God? 
like you've never done before. Forgive us of our sins. Wash us clean, oh God. Give us a pure heart, clean hands. I pray that you open up our eyes and our ears to be able to see you, to hear you. And Lord, whenever you speak, we say, here we are. Your servant is listening. Help us to forgive others, Lord. Please do not lead us into temptation. I pray that you keep the enemy far from us so that we can stay focused on your purpose that you have called us to. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Kid you not, the yard guys show up every time I start to film. (laughs) Or the garbage man. So if you hear the leaf blower, you know what it is. Starting off here in chapter one, there was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. Now, even though he is an Ephrathite, he's actually a Levite who lives in Ephraim. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, I want to stop here for a second to once again bring your attention to the fact that even though there was polygamy going on in this time, that was a social custom in this day. It was not condoned, nor was it encouraged by the Bible. And typically, whenever we even look at stories in the Bible of men who had taken multiple wives, there was often so much calamity that surrounded it. Now, one of the reasons that Alcana may have taken a second wife is because of the fact that Hannah was barren. And we know that barrenness back in this day was a big deal. It was looked at like punishment or a curse from God. Because if women were not able to have children, especially if they weren't able to have male children, then there would be no way for them to carry on the name of the father. And that would put the inheritance, the land at risk. But also they lived in an agrarian society. And so they needed children to be able to help and do the work. Verse three, now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. So remember Shiloh right now is the religious center north of Jerusalem because Jerusalem does not yet have the temple. Shiloh does. And so we see here that Elkanah is a godly man. You know, he is going to Shiloh and making those treks three times a year to celebrate the festivals where the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. So there's confirmation that he is a Levite and from the tribe of Aaron. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah, remember, she's the one who is barren. He gave a double portion. Now, a double portion typically in the Bible was given to the firstborn or the favored child. And he was doing this to be able to show her his love, that regardless of the fact that she can't have children, I still love you, honey, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Now, Penina's name actually means ruby, but she is anything but a precious gem. I mean, she is over there working for the devil with all of her taunting upon Hannah. And her lashing out actually stems from her own issues of rejection from her husband and probably jealousy of Hannah. So heart check. How do you deal with feelings of rejection or jealousy? How does it make you treat others? And even on the flip side of that, you know, if people are mistreating you, it is usually because they got something going on on the inside of them. And whenever you realize that, it really helps you to be able to kind of just dismiss what they're doing, especially if they are mistreating you for no good reason. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. So she is going into a depression here. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? So he's like, geez, am I worth nothing over here. And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Now, this child is technically already dedicated to the Lord for service by the fact that he is a Levite, but she's going another step. She's going to another level where she is going to dedicate 
dedicate him for life as a Nazarite. And remember, the Nazarite vow was usually taken for only a certain period of time. There were very few who actually took lifelong Nazarite vows. We just saw that through Samson. And they were not allowed to shave their heads. They were not allowed to drink alcohol. They were not allowed to touch a dead body. And they had to, during that time, completely devote themselves to the service of God. Now, she is making a vow. Some would say this is a rash vow. Some would say it's not. But nevertheless, she is putting her demands on God, saying, if you'll do this, then I will do that. And we really don't have the right to barter with God. You know, we're in no place to be able to do that. But he's still going to do good with with this. He is going to use this. He's going to give her her answer for his purposes. Now, as she continued praying before the Lord, so she is fervently praying. She doesn't stop. Eli observed her mouth. Now, Hannah was speaking in her heart and only her lips moved. How many of you all pray like that? You know, where you're just praying, praying with something. Nobody can tell what you're saying, but you are fervently praying in your spirit. Her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. So, he's already assuming that she's coming from this feast of partying, this lavish festival, and she is drunk. He's judging before he knows all the facts. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. And by the way, strong drink would have been like beer. But I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along, I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Now, worthless woman literally translates to daughter of Belial, which again, Belial will be the proper name for Satan later on. uh, But it really just means a woman without value. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. Now, I don't know if Eli at this point is giving her a word from God or if he's just kind of saying this to get rid of her. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So, this was the good thing that came out of it. She was praying, and then she sought counsel, and now she feels better. And we kind of all have an adversary perched on our shoulders, you know, who's constantly taunting us. He wants us to think that we your failures. He will do everything he can to make us think that we're terrible parents, to make us think that we are failing at life because we haven't reached certain goals. He'll make us think that people don't like us or even his favorite one. He'll make us think we are not good enough to get into heaven. And these thoughts will send us straight into a downward spiral of depression and anxiety if we let them fester. But what I love about Hannah is that she did not react like a wounded animal. She went straight to the Lord and she prayed fervently. She poured out her soul and she sought counsel. And in doing so, she was finally able to get some peace because she chose to believe in God's greater promise for her life. So heart check. When you're being taunted or are suffering from feelings of failure or depression, where do you go? Who do you talk to? Do you pour out your soul to the Lord? Verse 19, and they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. And I love that because they are worshiping before the miracle. Then they went back to their house at Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, so meaning it took some time for her to get this promise on her life and she never lost faith in the midst of it. Hannah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Samuel. Now, Samuel means name of God or asked of God. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Verse 21, the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. So this tells us that she is going to fulfill the promise that she made to the Lord and weaning a child Typically, a Hebrew child was not weaned until they were about two to three years old, and I'm sure she is taking her time keeping that baby for as long as she can. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull and an ephah of flour and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. So this is what would have been required for the ceremony of, of the Nazarite vow. 
And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So this word worship means to bow down. So this would have been a humble response of gratitude. So she has made the ultimate sacrifice. This is the greatest dedication of her entire life and the most costly one. And when you look at what a true sacrifice is, the greatest sacrifice that we have ever known is the sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross. It was the father giving his very own son to be able to save us. It cost dearly and sacrifice should cost us something. If it doesn't, then it really isn't a sacrifice. But what I love the most, as we're going to see, is that even though it cost her one child, God gave her five more. This shows us that we cannot outgive God. He will always bless us in return. Chapter two. So we went from a woman who was barren and fervently praying to now a woman who is blessed and praising. So Hannah prayed and said, and this is more like a psalm, honestly, this prayer, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. So remember, horn is something that represents strength. So this is a picture as if like her head is held high, kind of like a strong animal that is conscious of their strength. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. And remember the word holy is like set apart, but in this case, opposite of common or vulgar, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. God often compares himself to a rock because of the fact that he is strong. He is reliable. He is immovable. He's eternal. He is stable, finite, and unchanging. All of the things that we need in this crazy world that is so topsy-turvy and fast-paced, it is so hard for us to be able to find that solid foundation which is why we cannot put our hope in the things of this world. There is no success that you're going to be able to gain. There are no accolades that you're going to be able to collect that are ever really going to make you feel like you are on a firm foundation. It is only by putting your life in Christ, the one who will never fail us because everything else around it is simply sinking sand. And again, when we can get ourselves to have that perspective, it's really going to take off so many anxieties and worries because most of our anxieties and worries come from the fact that either we're losing something or we're not doing something. Verse three, talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth for the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. So here you can see her human nature coming out, obviously probably thinking about Penina here, but speaking of all people and she's like, you know what? You can do all you want and say all you want, but God, knows. God knows everything and he is going to hold you accountable for everything that you've spoken against me. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. So this is that picture that God will reverse things. You know, even though we can't understand why certain bad things happen, God will always turn it for good. Verse six, the Lord kills and brings to life. Now, this is not a picture of him murdering because it makes him happy. This is basically saying that he is the author and the finisher of life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. Ash heap would have been the place where they brought their refuse, their dumpy stuff. This would have been the worst of the circumstances to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. The pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. So this is metaphorical for the foundation of the earth. And this is what kept Hannah so strong in her faith all along, is that she knew that God was sovereign, that he was in control of all things in all situations. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. So no matter how strong you look now, 
it's not by might and not by power, but by his spirit that battles are going to be won and he will see us through. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them, he will thunder in heaven and the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, what is the most beautiful thing here is that from the mouth of a woman is the first time in the Bible that we are seeing reference to the anointed as the Messiah. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. So never discount the ministry and the availability of ministry for children. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men, so sons of Belial. They did not know the Lord, so they're doing all the religious stuff, fulfilling their duties, but they do not have a relationship with God. The custom of the priest with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and I'm like, rude. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Now, the priest was supposed to be allotted the breast and the right thigh. Like that was their portion. But here they're just taking whatever they want. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, uh uh-oh, this isn't good because this was supposed to be done before they took their portions and ate. Because remember, the fat is considered the most prized part of the animal. And then when I really thought about it, I'm like, you know, that is so God, right? Like he's going to say, I want the fat. That's the most valuable part of the animal. So really, in a sense, I'm like, was he doing that just to keep us from eating the fat, knowing that it's not good for us? never know the way of the Lord. He's awesome. So anyway, they're doing this before the fat was burned. The priest servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. Why would they only want raw meat? Probably considering the fact that they are so corrupt, they wanted to be able to sell it off and keep the money for themselves. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, "Mm -mm, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. So here we not only see them being greedy and rude, but also violent and using intimidation, which is kind of the last thing you think of a priest, but okay. Thus, Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. So it was with irreverence and disrespect here. Verse 18, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So still loves her son so very much, still wants to care for him as much as she can. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. And indeed, the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. So look at what happened, how he came near to her. It says he visited her to be able to meet her needs. And that's just the way of our God. You know, he will draw near to us so that he can give us whatever it is that we need. Verse 22, now Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So these are basically ancient sex scandals in the church. And he said to them, why do you do such things? So I'm like, what? Why are you asking why? You need to be handling this. And he said to them, for I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my son, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? Now, thankfully, we do have an intercessor now, that is Jesus. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. So there's really no consequence here for them. You know, he's just basically saying, why are you guys doing that? He's just slapping them on their hand a little bit. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. So very different for the life of Samuel, who is doing the right thing 
and is going to prosper because of it. Because if you remember what Moses said in Psalm 1, when he said, blessed is the man who doesn't walk with the ungodly and sit in the seat of scorners, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Everything he does will prosper. Anybody's delight in the law of the Lord, I'm believing that whatever we do is going to prosper. And that's not the prosperity gospel. I'm just reading from the word of God. And I'm not even talking about money. I'm just saying ministry is going to prosper. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, do I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father, meaning Aaron, when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? So here we're seeing kind of like the priestly duties listed. I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above? Above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people, Israel. Because Eli didn't discipline and correct his sons, I mean, he was essentially showing that he was more worried about offending them than he was about offending God. And we can sometimes parent this way. You know, we would rather our kids be our friend than us being their parent because we're so worried about them liking us. But in the end, that's going to be to their detriment, but also to our because now we're putting them before God with our fear of offense. And I mean, even in society, you know, we will dance around so many issues because we are afraid of offending people or certain groups. So we won't even talk about it or we will change the language so that it is more fitting and less offensive. And we even fail to witness because we are afraid of scaring people off or looking like we're weird. Side note, evangelism does not need to be weird. So hard check. Who are you more worried about offending, people or God? Verse 30, therefore the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, so he's changing this, far be it from me for those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress, you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, meaning succession, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and say, please, Put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. So here we see a judgment on the priests, and this will be partially fulfilled in chapter 22 at Nob, and then ultimately fulfilled in 1 Kings chapter 2. And this faithful priest that he's going to raise up, we believe is most likely Zadok after Abiathar was deposed. So that happening in 1 Kings chapter 1. But the ultimate fulfillment, the only one that we really need to be concerned about is the faithful priest being Jesus. Chapter three, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. So here he was at the temple ministering to the Lord and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. So this is not good because if you remember where there is no vision, the people will perish. And we're actually going to see how this is going to start to take place. And one of the reasons that the word of the Lord was rare in this time was because there was no one to speak through. Remember, their spiritual state was at an all-time low. And secondly, they simply weren't listening. I mean, they weren't tuned in to the frequency of God's voice. And today we have so much noise coming from every direction. You know, we got traffic, we got radios, TVs, podcasts, vlogs, Spotify, and both people and the devil yapping in our ears. I mean, it's no wonder that people cannot hear the voice of God. One of the most common things that I hear from people is that they don't know if God speaks to them, or they'll even worry about the state of their salvation because they aren't sure if they're hearing from the Lord or not. And some people will even say that God doesn't speak today. 
But let's remember that Jesus made it real clear when he said, I stand at the door and knock, and anyone who hears my voice, meaning he still speaks, and answers, he will come inside and he's going to hang out with them. So again, the problem isn't that God isn't speaking. The problem is that we cannot hear above all the other noise, or we simply just aren't tuned in to his frequency. Now, sidebar, if you're a Christian, I assure you, you have heard his voice. You responded to the invitation. So rejoice in that. And if you're reading his word, you're hearing his voice. So heart check. Are you tuned in to God's voice? Whenever he speaks, do you listen? Verse two, at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, meaning he was no longer effective in his leadership, was lying down in his own place. So these would have been his headquarters at the temple. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. So remember that the priest had like first watch, second watch. He clearly had the watch before dawn because the lamps had not yet gone out. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am, and ran to Eli. I love that because it's like he got excited and, and was eager to be obedient and be like, yes, what can I do? And he said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I didn't call, go lie down again. So he went and lay down and the Lord called again, which makes me so happy because he doesn't give up on us. If we don't hear him the first time, he's gonna say it again. Samuel and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, no, I didn't. Go lie down. Okay, sorry. He actually said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. <laughs> now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So isn't it interesting that Samuel lives in a godly home with a priest, and he most certainly has heard the word, but it hasn't yet been revealed to him, meaning he hasn't gotten revelation from God. And this really makes sense because Jewish tradition says that Samuel really couldn't have been but 12 years old or around that at this time, but God still chose to speak to him, a child. And it makes sense because he tells us that if we do want to get into the kingdom of heaven, we need to come as children, meaning that we need to stop thinking that we know everything and feel like we need to control everything. Instead, we need to go back to the days of innocence. And that is why he says that whenever we become Christians, whenever we're saved, we're a new creation. It's like we get to start over like a little child again. And I believe that when we have that kind of childlike faith, where we get excited to be in his word and we see his beauty everywhere and we are just excited to wake up and see what he's going to do next, that is when he's going to call us. So heart check. Do you have a childlike faith that has an innocence and wonder? Or are you still operating in the old habits of being doubtful and unfaithful? Verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Ah, then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, all right, go and lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now, what I find interesting here is that Eli wasn't the greatest father to his own kids, but look at what an amazing father he is at this point to Samuel. It's almost like God is redeeming that position in his life. And look at what he told Samuel. This is what he told him to do to be able to hear God's voice and hear it clearly. He said, go lie down. So this tells us that we need to be in a place where we make ourselves available. We put ourselves in a quiet and peaceful position. We posture ourselves to be able to hear him. So if you've got headphones going on, I mean, maybe some people can learn with chaos, but I'm not one of those people. I mean, as soon as my children get up in the morning, my studying is like out the window. That's why I wake up at two. So we need to have that distraction-free zone. And then he says, if he calls, he didn't say when. So he was not being presumptuous here. Instead, he is saying, be ready. He may or may not speak. We won't know. And then he says, if he does, you need to respond to him and say, speak, Lord. And he calls himself his servant, God's servant, meaning you have a heart of humility. So that is the same case with us. When we hear God speak, we respond in humility. Verse 10, and the Lord came and stood calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. 
Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Now, ears tingling in the Bible actually meant judgment was on the way. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming against God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering forever. So in other words, the judgment is sealed. There's no chance for repentance at this point. There is no atonement for the presumption of who God is or what he is going to do. So he failed in the sense of being a father. He didn't stop them when they did something wrong, but obviously he hasn't restrained them even at this point in all of their wickedness in being a priest. I mean, he's their boss. He's the high priest. So he never really did redeem himself with his own children. Verse 18, Samuel lay until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. I mean, nobody wants to be able to tell somebody that God's about to destroy you. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Don't hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So at this point, Eli wants the good, the bad, and the ugly. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So in the end, we see that Eli, regardless of the fact that he had failed, he was still faithful to God. And I can't imagine that this was easy for Samuel to tell him this stuff, but he did anyway. And he told him all of it. He didn't hold anything back. And that's the same way for us with the word of God. You know, we can't just dance around the icky parts of scripture. We need to declare all of it because all of it is important. Verse 19, and Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. So this goes to show that Samuel's prophecies all came to pass and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet to the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh for the Lord revealed revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So the people will be able to hear from God at this point as he is God's spokesman. He is a prophet, the first prophet in hundreds of years. And I just want to remind you, this isn't the kind of things that we face anymore. You know, as Christians, we've been covered. Jesus has taken on all judgment that was ever due to us. So that's not something that we really need to worry about. What we need to worry about is that our relationship with Jesus is strong. It's on that firm foundation foundation. It is immovable. There's nothing that is going to be able to come against us that's going to destroy us. So I just wanted to encourage you in that because really the only thing that is going to be able to separate you from God is if you do not choose him or you reject him. And if you are here today, you're not doing that. So take hope in that today because I know a lot of people kind of struggle with wondering like, am I going to go to heaven? Am I good enough? Am I going to get in? Am I going to miss the mark? Is he going to cast me away? And I've said it before, if you are worried about that, then that shows that you love him and you desire to be with him, that you don't want to be separated from him. So let's take a look at some of our deep dive questions. What might barrenness look like for the spiritual life? What characteristics can you see in Hannah, Eli, and Samuel? How do they inspire you? Is there something you've been waiting on an answer with the Lord? How does Hannah's fervent prayer and faith give you hope? Judging by Hannah's song, how well did she know God and his character? How can this help shape your prayer life? How might you distinguish God's voice from other voices? And how can we share difficult truth with grace? So Heavenly Father, we hear you. We hear you, Lord, and we are listening. Thank you so much for continuing to speak to us every single day through your word, through laughter with family and friends, throughout nature, by your Holy Spirit. We are so grateful, Lord, that we can see you and hear you in many things. And we wanna be like Samuel. You know, people who make ourselves available and posture ourselves so that we can respond quickly whenever you call. I pray that we are never presumptuous in assuming that you will speak about a certain thing at a certain time, but I ask that we remain humble and just simply wait on you. And in the meantime, I pray that all other frequencies will be tuned out so that we are receptive to your whisper. I pray that we will not try to speak over you with our own pride or stubbornness, but we'll simply be still and know that you're a God. 
We want to have an innocence and an excitement within us so that we can allow your wonder to be awe-inspiring. We don't want to grow cold to who you are or to what you do. And I pray for anyone, God, who may be struggling today with infertility. Will you speak a promise over them today, declaring that they have been chosen for a specific purpose in this life? And whether they are given a child or not, there is nothing that can diminish or devalue their worth as a child of God and as a woman in this world. I pray that all pressures and burdens will be lifted from them today and that you will bless them with your peace in knowing that your purpose will prevail. But we're going to be a little bit selfish here, God, and still ask, will you please give them a baby? And for anyone who may be dealing with depression, Lord, we bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. May that spirit be lifted off of them today. Help them to know that you are with them and that they're not alone. Teach us all how to know your peace and how to overcome any deep sorrow or grief, because we know we all go through seasons of that. And I thank you, Jesus, for understanding exactly what we're going through every single moment of our lives and being our greatest carrier of burdens. So we lay our burdens at your feet today, and I pray that you will calm our hearts and just ground us in your love. Help us to have an eternal perspective so that we can set our hope on higher ground and keep us steadfast in our faith, Lord, especially in those seasons that are a little bit tougher than usual. So we will continue to trust in your divine calling on our lives. And I pray that we will remain open to who, to what, when, where, and how you will get it all done. Because all you want from us is really just faithful obedience. So we're here for it. And we acknowledge your sovereignty in our lives and we submit ourselves to you. I thank you, Lord, for all of the blessings in our lives. And I pray that we never cease to dedicate it all for your glory. We hold our heads high today, knowing that you are our strength, even when we are at our weakest. There is none like you, God. So we exalt and magnify your holy name. Thank you for being our rock, our firm foundation, the one who is unchanging and immovable. Because we set ourselves upon that rock, we too will not be moved. The world may spin in chaos all around us, but we will not be shaken. We know that you will right every wrong, so we trust in you, and we thank you that we do not need to take matters into our own hands. And forgive us if we have acted worthless in any way, and thank you, Lord, for your mercy to forgive us of all sin. We know that there is nothing that can separate us from your love, but we still want to live a holy life, one that is reflective of you. We want a genuine relationship with you and to continue to draw closer with each passing day. I pray that we will raise up our children to be the same. So we ask again for vision, for revelation, for direction on how we can be faithful to your call. We know you're moving and doing mighty things, and I pray that we do not miss it whenever you call from heaven. We love you so much, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven 
of all my sins. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.